Well, good morning. This is the, the third lecture of uh, class on Maimonides, from Moses to Moses. There was no one like Moses. So, um, I want to begin, first of all, by uh, uh, el elaborating on a question that Brian had brought up last time as to whether or not um, Maimonides had had any impact on the Protestant Reformation. And it turns out there was more than, I had, uh, I had mentioned a couple of possibilities. Well, actually, I didn't say much at all. But I went back, and in fact, there was a lot more than I thought. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about the impact of Maimonides on, um, on legal theory in, in, Western, uh, in the Western legal tradition, which yeah. actually had a very important impact on certain ideas of ours. So um, when you look at the late Renaissance or Reformation period, you begin to see the rise of Christian scholars who are studying Hebrew. Um, and this starts in the late 15th century. One of the most prominent was a man by the name of Johannes Reuchlin, who uh, uh, was studied uh, the Bible in Hebrew. He was actually interested in Kabbalah and wrote a work on Kabbalah. Um, very often these Christian scholars would get tutors from the Jewish community, scholars, sometimes Jewish converts to Christianity. So. Johannes Reuchlin, who lived between 1455 and 1522, was one of the uh, early ones. Um, for his pains, he, he, had to, he was questioned by the Inquisition, but managed to escape. Uh, another very important one was a fellow by the name of Pico della Mirandola, who you may have heard of. He was an Italian philosopher who was one of the group of Christian Kabbalists, very influenced by Kabbalah, both from the original Hebrew and Aramaic, and also... Uh, there were numerous Kabbalistic texts that were being translated into Latin. Erasmus uh, knew some Hebrew, and of course Luther himself, uh, when he was translating um, the Bible into, um, uh, into German. But it was the 16th century that one scholar called the most biblical of European centuries. Um, and in many cases, according to this one um, extensive article that I read, a lot of the foundations of con conceptions of modern liberty uh, came from six, uh, seven, um, uh, 16th century uh, Bible scholars um, uh, in, in what are Calvinist and, and other third generation Protestant uh, thinkers. So to quote the article, there were biblical royalists, biblical republicans, biblical regnicides, biblical patriarchalists, <laughs> defenders of the old order, biblical economic revolutionaries and deniers of private property, biblical French imperialists, biblical English patriots and their biblical Scottish counterparts. Judge. Policies, polemics, and parodies were based on the Bible. Writers and readers alike were intimately familiar with the Old Testament. So the 16th century became the most um, biblical of European centuries. And from the 16th century to 1710, when the Enlightenment began to reject the Hebrew Bible as uh, superstition, uh, you had many attempts to use the Bible for government and law from monarchists to radicals like the English levelers who believed in a kind of radical egalitarianism based upon the notion that, what, as their famous saying was, when um, Adam delve and Eve span, who was then the gentleman. In other words, that all came from a common origin with no aristocracy. So law uh, tended to focus on three areas, and this is where Maimonides seems to have had the most influence. Number one, international borders were being discussed a lot, especially the laws of the sea, which there was a great dispute between the English and the Dutch. Um, and these, were, these discussions of uh, borders were often based on biblical ideas of the tribal allotments. Uh, two, the notion of a moral economy, which emphasized the common good and limits on property rights. And thirdly, the notion of a federal republic, which was based upon the idea of the Israelite tribal confederacy. In other words, the Israelites prior to the rise of the monarchy, which emphasized a decentralized government, which was both under divine will, but with lots of personal freedom. So these are the areas that the, um, the writers tended to do, and they were particularly um, uh, influential in English and Dutch law. 
because there you had a lot of, uh, especially in the 17th century, you had a lot of Protestant um, thinkers who were uh, Hebraicists. So, um, and they were working either from the original Hebrew or from Latin translations of the Mishnah Torah because by the 17th century you began to see Latin translations of uh, much of the Mishnah Torah. That's one of the, uh, the advantages of the fact that it was written in such a clear uh, Hebrew uh, and not in a kind of Aramaicized rabbinic Hebrew that those who had studied <coughs> biblical Hebrew could easily read the Mishnah Torah. So the most important was an uh, Englishman named John Selden who lived from 1584 to 1654. He was a very important English jurist and legal theorist. And he um, read biblical laws as interpreted in the Talmud and the Mishnah Torah. And he believed that they contained the heart of common law to all humanity. That was one of the things that Selden was most interested in, the notion of natural law. What are the laws that bind all human societies together? So he wrote a work called De Jure Naturali et Gentium Juxta Disciplinarium Ibrae uh, Orum in 1640. What this deals with is the seven laws of the sons of Noah, um, which were the rabbis developed out of uh, Genesis 1 and Genesis chapter 9 as being seven laws that are a covenant that God gave to all of humanity prior to the particular covenants given to Abraham and then at Mount Sinai. And uh, so Selden was looking at these seven Noahide laws and he had a, a, a work, work on each one of them as this kind of the basic natural law for all humanity. He also wrote a book in 1646 called Uxor Hebraica, meaning the Hebrew wife, um, which dealt with sex. Now in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 7-9, this of course is um, uh, Paul, there's a famous quote that says, it is better to marry than to burn, which is not really a great promotion of marriage. So the idea is, that it came across in a lot of Christian writing was the notion that um, sex for, um, uh, for uh, passion's sake was a kind of uh, quasi-sin. So marriage was kind of seen as a concession to baser instincts, that the real love, the true love, is love of God, and is non, uh, uh, non-physical. What about the idea of procreation? That's the only reason to have sex. And technically speaking, in, in Catholic law, that's the only reason to have sex, is procreation. And actually, technically, in Catholic law, when a married couple gets beyond their uh, years where they can procreate, they're not supposed to have sex anymore. But that, of course, is not really followed anymore. Um, so, um, Depending on which Catholics you listen to. Well, yes, of course. Uh, well, the previous pope tried to promote that idea at one point, and it just never went anywhere. Uh, so what, what Selden was trying to do was to recast Christian legal concepts of sex as a blessing, which is closer to what it is in the Hebrew Bible and into Jewish law. And as a result, he had a major impact on John Milton's views on marriage and divorce. Um, so that marriage no longer was a sacrament, which it is in the uh, Catholic tradition, but a private contract between uh, the man and the woman. And neither the state nor clergy have any authority over the institution of marriage. This has certain relevance today, as you can imagine, right? Uh, that it is a private arrangement between two loving individuals, and the state really has no role, uh, nor the established religion, and no role in sanctifying that uh, legally, anyway, creating that um, that contract. Yes, Brian. The other person is Hobbes, who is considered a bad guy these days, but wrote <coughs> about ten years after the English Civil War began, and his concept is really about the rule of law. Yes. Uh, driven in part by the economic changes and the need for the property classes to have what you know, we now call like the rule of law for contracts like in Russia, so just people will invest. Mm -hmm. But in that sense, the state really does stand to help parties enforce the terms of the contract, Ex yes, but not true. to sanctify it. Exactly. And in fact, Hobbes was a big reader of Selden. Hobbes was influenced by Selden's perspective and by the on next these. Guy you're talk yes, about. Uh, the, the, the second one I want to mention was the famous Dutch jurist, Hugo Grotius, G R O T I U S, who lived from 1583 to 1645. He was a contemporary of Selden. They were in contact with one another. 
He used Selden's work. So through uh, Grotius, which, who has had a tremendous impact on Western law theory, uh, and through Selden, um, Maimonides' Mishnah Torah has had a profound impact upon the Western legal uh, tradition. So I want to stop there because that in itself is a huge topic and I just wanted to touch upon it briefly uh, to show you another way in which Maimonides uh, was influential uh, on, in Western civilization. I think I mentioned in my first lecture that uh, he, was a, he was a major influence on Thomas Aquinas who used Maimonides' Guide for the Perplexed as one of his sort of basic books from which out of which he learned Aristotelianism. So what I want to pass on to now, of course, is the very, the, we're going to look at the first uh, book of the uh, Mishnah Torah, which is called the Sefer Madda, often translated as the Book of Knowledge. But in this particular case, um, the word Madda uh, means not only knowledge, but cognition, science, and consciousness. So Maimonides begins with the commandments that are more in the realm of philosophy and ethics. And in this respect, he is unique and radical and completely novel in Jewish legal codes. If you, for example, were to look at the um, Shulchan Aruch and you were to see how it is arranged, and maybe I'll make up a list of those, how the Shulchan Aruch is arranged, so you can see it as by comparison um, with the Mishnah Torah. Uh, it's divided into four major uh, areas, uh, gotten from the earlier code of the tour. And um, the first part of the first uh, major section of the Shulchan Aruch begins with the laws of what you do when you wake up in the morning. So, in other words, it's a completely different arrangement, of a more traditional arrangement in many ways. Uh, and it was a kind of rejection of Maimonides' classification because Maimonides was a firm believer that what you believed would have a profound impact on how you behaved. Uh, your basic beliefs about God, as well as your uh, d uh, mental dispositions and moral values. It would not only have an impact on your behavior, but literally on your physical health. And there is a section of the Sefer Madah um, which is not translated in your anthology, but I can certainly, uh, if you're interested, supply you with it, which talks about diet, okay? What kinds of foods you should uh, always eat, which ones you should avoid, and which ones you should never eat. I think you'd be actually quite surprised when you saw the diet. Yes? Interestingly, there's uh, a bunch of modern research that shows the biochemical changes that occur in the brain and elsewhere in the body when a person participates in belief-driven practices. Yes, yes. Prayer, meditation, so forth. And Maimonides wasn't really so new in what he was doing, um, but he reflected a kind of holistic perspective on the human being. Which Even, is, sorry. Go ahead. Which is very... It's a lot more modern-like, but it's also yeah. more, more biblical in many ways. Although he understood the soul, as you will see, as a separate entity, nonetheless, the soul and the body in Maimonides is not really what I would call a really hard dualism, but a kind of medium dualism, where there is a definite interrelation between the two and they are bound together until death. It's a death where the soul uh, departs. So, um, in the... Um, uh, in the Sefer Madah, you have uh, five treatises, and if you look at the list that I have previously given you, you will see um, what, the, what they deal with. Uh, the first one is called Foundations of the Torah, which we are going to start looking at today. Uh, and then one called Discernment, um, which is where you get ideas of uh, moral values, and that's where you're going to get the, uh, the, 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 the diet. Uh, the third treatise is on the study of the Torah, then on idolatry. Um, and then lastly on repentance. And uh, the treatise on repentance, by the way, is, became extremely popular as a separate, um, <coughs> was often um, written and uh, um, printed separately as a wonderful, it's one of the best things on repentance often read around the time of the high holidays uh, and really worth studying. Uh, anyway, so let, we're going to be looking at the, um, what's called the Yusudei HaTorah, the foundations of the Torah. And if you take a look at the material I sent you 
um, yesterday. If anybody needs a copy, I have I have copies. Please. I think I just gave you one recently. Oh, did you? I'll pass this down to George, please. Right. Um, what Maimonides does at the beginning of each treatise which um, mm -hmm. is not reflected in our anthology, and by the way, in the anthology, you, sh you should turn to page 43, um, you will see he, first of all, lists the commandments, the mitzvot, that will be covered in that treatise. So in the Yisudei HaTorah, in the foundations of the Torah, there are six positive commandments and four negative commandments. Those positive and negatives being the classic rabbinic division of the commandments, you shall, positive, you shall not, negative. And um, this, of course, is part of, from Maimonides' list of the 613, which we talked about last week, how he established his own list of the 613. <clears throat> and you'll notice um, some very um, interesting um, things here. Um, it, um, it begins in chapter 1, with um, not with creation and not with revelation, but with God as a necessary being. Okay, um, and uh, Maimonides associates this God with the God of the patriarchs, and he bases this on a midrash that says that Abraham, and he's going to, he, we will see this in his treatise on. Um, uh, on uh, on idolatry, because he quotes the he kind of quotes the midrash that Abraham you know one of the big mysteries in the Bible is in chapter twelve of Genesis God just out of nowhere uh, calls up speaks to Abraham and it doesn't say why we're never told why he chose exactly and there's the famous midrash that Abraham smashed the idols in his father's mm -hmm. idol shop and that has become so popular a lot of people think it's in the Bible okay <laughs> but um, the mid, that is actually part of a larger midrash in which Abraham wanders around trying to figure out the meaning of life and the governance of the world, and he begins to rationally consider what is behind all of this. At first he thinks maybe it's the sun, but the sun sets. He goes through a series of things. Finally, he comes to his own conclusions that there has to be only one God, and, and that's when he goes smashes the idols, uh, and... Um, tries to promote it, and when God sees that he has come to the state, that's why God chooses him. So Maimonides picks up on that and says that Abraham was a philosopher who used reason to discover God. So Abraham becomes the exemplar of what um, Maimonides is talking about. And so for Maimonides, the God of the Bible becomes, in effect, the same as Aristotle's idea of God as the unmoved mover, right? And, um, and, and and what I want you to do is take a look at the material that I've given you. The thing we have to realize, this is the way, the, this is the universe, the way Maimonides and all his contemporaries uh, thought it was. That the earth is at the center and water and uh, earth and the, and the material of earth, we'll get to that, in fact, are what you know, composes the sort of core of matter, and above that is fire and air, uh, sorry, air and then fire, and then you have the, the circle of the moon. And remember, these are spheres. In other words, this is a two-dimensional perspective of it, but what you're looking at is a spheric earth enclosed in these things as shells in which the celestial bodies are kind of rolling around in. Um, so anything that is sublunar has matter. Anything that is above the moon is not matter of the kind that you find on the earth. It's, it's kind of a, an ethereal kind of matter which is uh, unchanging and, and uh, does not decay. And that all of these planets, in fact, are living intelligences. They are not um, uh, inert bodies of matter. And this was all commonly held. Um, uh, and you'll see that above Saturn, because that's as far as you can go uh, with the naked eye, is uh, Saturn. You can't see the other planets because there were no telescopes at the time. You have the fixed stars, what we and especially what we call the ecliptic, the belt of the stars of the zodiac, which, in, which do circle the Earth, uh, move as a band around the Earth. Uh, and then above that, the prima mobile, which is kind of the the, uh, the final um, uh, sort of intermediary between God 
and, and, and the universe. Now, this is actually a simplified version of it. Um, they, uh, astronomers knew that the planets didn't always go perfectly in these, these things. In fact, Venus goes backwards. And so they invented a whole bunch of what are called epicycles, cycles within cycles, to account for it. Uh, and as the Middle Ages got, went on, um, these epicycles became increasingly complex as astronomical observ uh, uh, observations became increasingly detailed to the point where the system became so complicated that's when Copernicus came along and said, you know, if we put the sun at the center, a lot of this stuff just disappears, right? I mean, Copernicus did this without any uh, new, uh, without a telescope. He just tried to come up with a system that simplified what observations. But this is kind of what, this is what Maimonides lived under. And by the way, the philosophical version of this, which sees this as perfect and sees this as orderly, was never 100% reconcil reconciled with the actual astronomy. It was too complicated. So they tended, the philosophers tend to kind of gloss over that. So, um, uh, if you take a look, for example, so what I, I mentioned before that Maimonides does not start with creation. He does not start with revelation. And if you turn to page 417, you will see there his famous um, 13 principles of faith, um, which is in his commentary to the Mishnah. Um, and if you take a look, um, they're not quite in the same order as he discusses it here. In other words, He's changed his priority of describing God, okay? Um, because if you take a look, it does start with God's existence and God's oneness um, and God's incorporeality and God's eternity. That's the fourth one. But really, in, in the beginning, it is the existence of the Creator. He doesn't say that in the foundations of the Torah. That's one of the fascinating things. And... He apparently omits creation because he's, he is um, proceeding on the premise of the eternity of the universe, the Aristotelian notion of the eternity of the universe, without a specific point of creation, um, as the proof of a first mover. He's, he really wants to really see that because, a good, because it's a good proof and it's a foundation of God's oneness and in, in incorporeality which is what he's really interested in. In the Guide for the Perplexed, he really grapples with the various theories of creation um, that existed, the Aristotelian notion that the universe was eternal and was not created at all, the Neoplatonic notion of primordial matter out of which the universe emerges. In other words, there's an eternal primordial matter out of which the universe emerges. And of course, the biblical idea as understood by Maimonides' time that God creates the universe out of nothing. But we will leave that for a later time. Um, so, let's take a look. Uh, the one last thing I want to do is go to turn the page on the material I gave you, the other side. And um, he relies, in the beginning, of the proof for the existence of what's called the cosmological argument for the existence of God. This is um, Aristotle as reformulated by uh, what, who was known as Al-Farabi, a very famous... Um, a Muslim scientist and philosopher who lived between around 872 to 950. Maimonides was well aware of the works of Al-Farabi. And even more important, uh, Ibn Sina, who was known in the West as uh, Avicenna, uh, who lived between 980 and 1037. These were two really important Muslim philosophers and scientists whose works were extremely widespread. So Maimonides is getting this through his Aristotle through them. And this is the classic cosmological argument for the existence of God. Uh, Irma, do you want to read it for Every, us? Everything that begins to exist has a cause of its existence. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause of its existence. Since no scientific explanation in terms of physical laws can provide a causal account of the origin of the universe, the cause must be personal. Explanation is given in terms of a personal agent. So in other words, everything that exists has a cause. That has a cause. That has a cause. Going back to the beginning of the universe, which must have a cause. By the way, there are discussions of this to this day amongst scientists, philosophers, and theologians. 
But this is the classic argument for the existence of God, one of the three classical arguments for the existence of God. In the Middle Ages, they actually thought it, they were proofs. Um, now we refer to them as arguments. Um, uh, the other two being the teleological and the ontological. Um, and Maimonides uses this in, the, in his uh, foundations of the Torah uh, to prove the existence of God. So why don't we look and begin to read um, his material on page um, 43. And um, if you want to keep those extra sections that I gave you handy, we may get a chance to look at a couple of them.